The Last Sunday in Epiphany, Year A. From the second epistle of Peter, we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. In the name of the one spoken by the prophets, even the Holy Spirit, who with the Father and the Son lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. The event we're focusing on this week is the Transfiguration, by which we mean the transformation of Jesus' appearance in splendid display of his glorious divinity, not merely as a display of power, but also a display of significance that crosses, that's the trans part, layers of expression, that's the figuration. Jesus displays himself in the Transfiguration as both specifically his flesh and blood self up on the mountaintop with his disciples, and also the figure spoken of by the prophets and encountered in turn by Moses and Elisha. This is what Peter means about the disciples not following cleverly devised myths. Instead, the disciples were eyewitnesses, seeing the prophetic message more fully confirmed. After witnessing the three figures together, talking on the mountaintop, the disciples knew that Jesus actually was the Beloved, receiving the Lord's pronouncement in our psalm. This makes a big difference, and it's why Peter next says that no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. We see in our first reading that the mountaintop experience looks kind of scary from the bottom of the mountain. From out of that cloud, God calls Moses, and within that cloud, Moses receives the law. In recognition of that connection, Peter offers to build three dwellings on the mountain. Because in the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, the people celebrate God's provision for the people of Israel in the wilderness and God's glory appearing as a pillar of fire and cloud. Peter understands that the rituals he knows from worship are reenactments of a reality he's seeing unfold in front of him. Jesus not only makes that provision, he is that provision for the people. Jesus' transfiguration matters to us because living the life of faith requires more than merely an interpretation of the texts. If we're going to follow the disciples by first submitting to the Lord in fear and then getting up to walk on unafraid, then we must be able to trust that the Lord who commands our obedience and the Lord who lays down his life for us, and the Lord who dazzles us with glory are, in fact, one and the same Lord. In the name of that Lord, who is Father, Son, 